Rick Bradford is the author of The Empathy Gap. We've spoken to him before about matters to do with men's experience, particularly in the family court, and relationships between men and women. This time we've had a chance to talk to him about education. He's done a huge amount of work analysing the influences that affect the outcomes for children in education. And it is a fascinating and detailed survey. Well, Rick, thank you so much for coming back again and talking to us. I think this is probably your third or fourth podcast. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing about this particular topic because it's all about education. And you're going to deal with three specific issues, you say. Yes, that's right. And, and um, to some extent, they're inspired by recent government reports. Um, so one of the topics I want to talk about is the intersection of sex and race in the context of educational attainment. And I was inspired to look at this by the government's, in, uh, the report from the Independent uh, Committee on Racial and Ethnic Disparities that was published at the end of March. And uh, they were concentrating, of course, on race, um, which isn't normally something I I get into. I'm more interested in gender issues. Um, but the intersection of those two things, race and gender, is is very, very interesting. So that's the first thing I'll look at. Um, that will rather naturally lead on to a more detailed look at um, the gender breakdown in higher education, so university level. Um, and what the statistics are there. And this is something I've been tracking for many years. Um, and I can pretty much guarantee there are things in that which will surprise people greatly, I think. So it's definitely worth going through that. Interesting. And if, um, if there's time, I want also to um, look at something I've done for just identifying some examples of teacher bias at school, both at primary school and at day level. Um, so I'm not saying that the uh, all everything to do with educational attainment is to do with bias. Let me make that clear from the start. But it is rather egregious that there is an element of bias which makes it even worse. Um, okay. the, the the other. A gov recent government report that's worth mentioning, although I won't return to this, I won't go into it in any detail, is exactly a week ago, last Tuesday, um, the Select Committee on Education published a report on um, disadvantages in education, specifically to the white working class. So that's very pertinent to the sort of things that I'll be talking about today. Um, and this, uh, if anyone hasn't caught up with that report, they, they should, because there's some uh, very interesting material in that. But I, I, won't go, I won't go into that in any more detail. Excellent. OK, so I'm going to be relying quite heavily on uh, on graphical presentation here because it's the it's the best way of presenting these statistics. So let's turn now to, uh, if you will, to my first um, my first bit of evidence, which is on intersection of sex and race. So let me say straight away this this data that I'm going to be presenting comes partly from the government report, the uh, independent. Committee on um, Racial and uh, Ethnic Disparities. It comes partly from that. Um, in the case of GCSE data, almost entirely from that. Um, but in the case of higher education data that I'll show you, um, they don't disaggregate my sex in, um, in that case. So I've also used UCAS data for, for that, because they do disaggregate my sex. OK, so you probably see on your screen now, hopefully, um, some um, yeah. summary conclusions that I've made from this review. Yeah, we've got that. Um, I think I won't, I won't go through the words. I'll go straight to the pictures because they tell the story. So I'll just talk to the words, to the, to the pictures. 
So hopefully you can see figure one on the screen here now. Yeah, we've got that. Yeah. Um, let me let me um, describe what it is first of all. It's GCSE data. Um, so it's disaggregated by race and sex. And this first graph relates to average socioeconomics. So in a, in a minute I'll show you uh, a different socioeconomic slice through the data. So the, these in terms of wealth, if you like, or class, is fairly average. So it's looking just at the race and sex issue, this, this graph. And this is GCSE. And the me what's meant by the mean best eight score is they take for every pupil their best eight GCSE exams and add the scores together. So um, GCSEs are now scored numerically from one to nine, where nine is the top grade. So a grade nine scores nine, a grade eight scores eight, and so on. So you get a total score for um, for each pupil, and then the mean is the, the average across the race and sex population in question. Um, and then what's been done here is it's been actually been expressed as a standard deviation. So they, they take all that data and they find the standard deviation of it so that they can present the data in terms of difference from the mean. So zero on the graph means the population mean. Anything above that is the, uh, the relative number of standard deviations above the mean. And just to clarify this figure, Rick, the, the key doesn't tell you clearly which is boys and which is girls because they're all oh. shown as black and white. So oh. how should we understand um, those, the key there? Right, on my screen I'm looking at blue and pink. <laughs> no, it doesn't, it's not coming across very clearly, Arna, uh, ah, I don't okay. think. So you might just have to it's, tell us what it's saying. OK, it's quite easy to tell which are the boys and which are the girls because the higher ones are the girls. <laughs> <In every case. laughs> so it, that's clear. All so right. if, yeah. if we look at Bangladeshi, the, who are the, the, uh, clearly the brightest here, um, this is the girl here. Yeah, you see my got cursor that. there. Good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that's, that's the girls, and the boys are, um, for me, the, the blue bar on the left. Yeah. yeah. So sure. it, again, in, so the, the girls are the ones on the right and higher. Yeah. So India, yeah. this is girls, this is boys. And at the other ends, the black Caribbeans, um, the boys are the ones at minus. Yeah, we can see that. Four, yeah. And the girls are around about zero. <coughs> so in, in every case, uh, in every ethnicity, that is, the girls outperform the boys. That's the stark message. So, the, uh, but there is also, of course, very clearly a racial um, mm. gradient. Yeah. Um, one of the things that the the government's race report was pointing out is that the BAME classification is completely useless <laughs> because that implies that. The the useful division is between white and non-white, but it's not because um, most of mm. these, the high end, are non-white. So it's completely even the term black is useless because you see black Africans do quite well, whereas mm. black Caribbeans are at the bottom. Yeah. Mm. So the, you know you can read a lot into this, such as for example. Well, it's not genetics then, is it? Because presumably uh, black Africans, black Caribbeans have a strong commonality of, of genetics. But nevertheless, there's a great difference in educational attainment. We'll see that throughout. Hmm. If we now look at the... It's the same data, but now looking at one standard deviation of socioeconomics below the norm. So these are the poorer people, or less privileged people economically, if you like. That's what it now looks like. So again, you find that the girls outperform the boys in every ethnic group. So the boys are on the left again in this, in, in all the of boys these groups. Are on, the boys are on the left. So that's boys, yeah. girls, boys, girls. The bottom of the heap, as it was before, are white British and black Caribbeans, uh, with white British and black Caribbean boys being the very bottom of all. Um, so... Whereas for, for average socioeconomics, all the girls were above the mean and some of the boys were above or below the mean. When you go to the lower socioeconomics, the girls are now splitting either side of the mean. 
some of the girls do better than the mean despite the wealth disadvantage, but virtually all the boys are below the mean. So, in other words, there's an intersection between sex, race, and socioeconomics. And just to clarify that, just a little bit more clearly, this second chart is showing people who are socio socioeconomically disadvantaged. That's right. That's yeah. right. So you yeah. see all those bars are diminished or dropped down yeah. to a lower value, either yeah. smaller yeah. and positive or larger and negative yeah. than the yeah. ones on the preceding graph, which is exactly yeah. what you'd expect. Yeah. It's not an advantage to be poor. <coughs> that's, that's clear. Yeah. But the order, the racial order and the sex order is the same for both. Yeah. The other thing that the, um, the government's report um, talked about is exclusions from school. So this is the real bottom of the heap, um, where you really no longer have much of a chance if you're ex excluded from school. And these are permanent exclusions. But that report did not disaggregate by sex. It was only looking at the race issue. That was its remit, of course. And what they were at pains to point out is that it, it wasn't that non-whites were um, discriminated against by being excluded more. Um, it was the usual culprits, actually, that were worse off, the black Caribbeans in particular. But the other races, the races that tend to, or the ethnicities that tend to do better educationally, Bangladeshis, Indians, uh, Chinese, uh, they, they have less exclusions than the yeah. white, white British. Um, so they, they pointed that out very well, and that was certainly well worth pointing out. But they didn't... I mean, the, the elephant in the room when it comes to exclusions is the sex issue. We all know that boys are excluded far more often than girls. So what mm. I've done here is I've taken their data and added the, uh, the disaggregation by sex as well. And you see that the blue... Can you see the blue and the orange? Yes, we've yes, got the colours here. Yeah. Right, OK. That's probably because it's bold in this case. Um, mm. So the blue lines are the boys, and you see that they're mm. very clearly higher. That typically is about three times higher than the girls. So just making that, that point on that one. Um, then we move to um, higher education. So this is where I'm using both the government, de the, the government report data and the UCAS data. So let's look at progression rates into higher education. So this is the proportion of a given race and sex group that go on to university or, the, or other higher education institutions. So the, the order of the ethnicities are very much the same as before, slight differences, but you've got the Chinese, the Bangladeshis, the Indians, and note the black Africans at the top end, where the entrance into university is very high, 60, 70, 80, 88% in the case of Chinese girls, for example. So can and we just ask what FSM stands for? F, sorry, yes. FSM is free school meals. So what we're looking uh -huh. at here is is non-FSM. <coughs> yeah. So this first graph is the the average socioeconomics. Mm -hmm. So FSM is used as a surrogate for lower socioeconomic groups. So non-FSM yeah. means you're not of the lower socioeconomic yeah. group. So these are the average the average people in terms of class or wealth. Okay. Um, and then down the bottom end, as before, we've got the white British and the black Caribbeans. And it's the, again, the white British and the black Caribbean boys that are the lowest of all. But that's the average socioeconomics. Um, if we move now, again, the same data, but looking at um, the free school meal population. So this is the lower socioeconomics you see it becomes an even starker difference. So there's a gradient between the ethnicities here, of course, and the sexes. But if you just um, recall that graph in your mind, you see the gradient when we look at free school meal data is considerably greater. Yes, Down very or up at the, the, to the top end, the Chinese women, it's still nearly 80%, despite being 
um, you know, free school meals being disadvantaged in terms of wealth, they still do extremely well in terms of entry to university. But down the, the other end, where it's increasingly evident that the white British are even lower than the black Caribbean, mm. uh, the boys now, the white British boys, 12% compared with nearly 80% for Chinese women. Mm. That it's a really, really emphatic difference. And as I've pointed out before, black Africans do very well in university entrance. They're, they're second to only to the Chinese and ahead of Bangladeshis and Indians. Mm. Whereas the black Caribbeans or the mixed black Caribbean and white British are right down at the bottom. So this mm. isn't black versus white. It's something else. Um, and that same data, but um, just looked at in a different way by looking at the excess of women over men so looking so effectively you're looking at the difference between the the red and the blue bars here and plotting out what that looks like this is the percentage by which um, there are more women than men progressing to higher education and it's positive of course in every case there are more women than men in every uh, ethnic group but for Chinese or Bangladeshi or Indian who do very well, the sex difference is quite small, 10%, something like that, relatively modest. But where there's um, only a small um, percentage progressing to higher education, the sex difference is also much larger and greatest for the black Caribbean. So black Caribbean men, well, black Caribbean women are 90% more likely to go to university than black Caribbean men. Mm -hmm. Although both of them, of course, are relatively unlikely compared to the top end. And in the case of white British, I should say this is for UK domiciled people, by the way. So this is excluding students who come from abroad. So we're looking just at UK citizens here. Mm -hmm. In terms of the white British, white British women are 45% more likely to go to university than white British men. And that is, given that this is um, numerically by far the largest group, that's worth bearing in mind when we look at the more detailed further education statistics, 45%, huge difference. Okay, so that's the, that's the intersection of, of ethnicity and sex and to some extent socioeconomics as well. So what I wanted to do next, I mean I can pause at that point to take any questions if you have no, any. I think we're fine on. actually, it's very clear Rick. No, it's great. Okay, so what I want to do next is look at the more detailed picture in terms of higher education. So hopefully you can now see Yeah, we've got your screen. Screed. Um I might just go through the uh, the big picture um, conclusions here before I regale you with more graphs. I've been tracking this for oh, six, seven, eight years now. Um, so none of this comes as a surprise to me when I've updated it this year. It only gets worse is the overall position. Uh, women first outnumbered men as undergraduates in the UK uh, in 1993. So well over a quarter of a century ago now, 28 years ago. Um, looking at all entrants, there are 36% more women entering university than men now. And if you look just at UK domiciled women overall, it's 38.6%. And as I said, if you can find that to the white demographic, it's 45%. Uh, if you look at subjects, uh, there's two different ways of breaking the subject categories down. I'll say a little bit more about what they are, but however you break it down, women dominate in between 70% and 73% of subject categories. Not surprising since there's more of them. Um, this is the one that will blow people's minds and I will say more about the details of this in a minute. Women outnumber men as undergraduates in STEM subjects. That's STEM with two M's. 
So that's science, technology, engineering, maths, medicine, and subjects, subjects allied to medicine. So I'll go into the, um, uh, the, the issues surrounding definitions about that, because it's important to clarify that. But that's the one that people do a double take and think, surely not, that can't be right. After everything we hear about getting more women in STEM. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you, if you left off the final M and called it just STM, then it would be men that would be dominant. Yeah. So that final M is very important there. But um, for those people who are... You mean, you mean there's so many women going into medicine? There's medicine and subjects allied to medicine, yeah. yes. That's, uh, yes, of course, that's, not that's, just doctors. That's the yeah. area where women dominate. Women actually dominate in the pure sciences as well, and I'll, <laughs> I'll come into that um, in some more detail. So men are actually only dominate in the T, the E, and the first M, technology, engineering, and maths. So I'll, I'll show you the, the numbers on that. Um, I'll mention this in passing, but I'll not elaborate. People that know what Athena Swan is, Athena Swan actually concentrate on STE double M. So it's not just that I've invented that category. So that is that is what people do look at these days. So in terms of the subjects where there's emphatic dominance by one sex or the other, so defining this as being where there are more than twice as many of one sex than the other, there are two subjects, um, and I'm using the HECOS category here, um, there are two subjects where men dominate, and they're engineering and computing, which will surprise no one. Uh, but there's actually nine subjects where there are more than twice as many women as men. Uh, and they're subjects allied to medicine, psychology, veterinary science, agricultural science, which may be a surprise to some people, humanities and liberal arts, social sciences, law, languages, and education and in the case of education and veterinary science which I think I missed out oh, I should have put that in there no, are more fair. than yeah there are about six times as, as many women as, as men okay let's let me go um, to the graphs now and um, put some flesh on those bones so first of all the the stem analysis let me let me explain in some more detail how these numbers arise because you can argue about the detailed figures here because there is an ambiguity as to what you include as a science and the biggest bugbear here is you'll like this george <laughs> whether you include psychology as a science or not <laughs> so, okay <laughs> <laughs> discuss discuss so in 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 the I think it's the psychiatry that's not the science, actually. <laughs> Psychology, sadly, is very I, scientific. <laughs> I've got no bones to bear, you know. I'm uh, a physicist, so I think I uh, pretty <laughs> firmly know what camp I'm in. In the Jack S3 classification, psychology is included in the biological sciences, whereas in the, the HECOS classification, it is not. Okay. And there's another similar ambiguity... Um, well, in my mind, there is, as to whether you include veterinary science and agricultural science as sciences or not. So you put those two things together, you've got four permutations of possibilities as to what you include in the S of STEM. Mm -hmm. OK, so you can get four different numbers for the percentage by which the number of female undergraduates exceeds the number of, of male undergraduates. And until this year, you could dispute female dominance because one of those numbers was less than one, was negative. But now, well, from 2020 for the first time, they're all positive. So it's now unambiguous. However you define it, there are more women in STE double M than men. So Whether let's just turn that into real numbers because percentages may be confusing. But that means if you had 100 men doing the S subjects, you will have 120 and a half women. Yes, doing, the, right? doing the STE double M subjects, yeah. yes, that's yeah. right, yeah. So or in the case 20 of it's 1%, it's only 100 versus 101, so exactly, it's, a, yeah. it's a trivial yeah. difference. Yeah. yeah. So the difference is not large, but the point is, of course, what I'm really getting over is 
the, the popular narrative is that men dominate in STEM and we constantly hear calls to get more women in STEM. Yeah. Oh, well, and as long as you're talking about STE double M as the definition of STEM, it's completely um, out with the empirical evidence. Um, so if you look at how that's changed with time, if you use the Jack S3 definition where psychology is a science, this is how that has been changing with time. So this is the 20% here. And you see that women only became dominant relatively recently in 2014. So it's a recent, recent phenomenon. I've been tracking this each year, to seeing this go up. But no one else is pointing this out. It, it's, it's there, in hidden in plain sight, in the UCAS data. You've just got to look at it and plot the numbers. But no one ever talks about it. And you can do the similar thing for sciences alone, and again, it depends on how you do the definition. So if something, you Something happened in 2007, looking at your previous figure. Something happened in yeah, yeah. 2007. What, Is that a statistical happened. anomaly? Or is that don't know. Real? It might be they changed the definition of the subject cat categories. Don't know. Yeah, yeah, they do yeah. change every so often, which makes it very hard to track trends, which is annoying. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know what happened there, but it was it was less than one. I and mean, I'm really just interested in whether. It was I think if you start at 2008, that's the that's the yeah that's yeah. the picture, isn't it? Yeah, the UK, I mean, it's the UCAS files that you can get these days happen to start at 2007. Mm -hmm. Presumably they've got the data going back many, many decades before that. Uh, we can skip over the science data, but it, I mean, it's the subject of the same ambiguity regarding whether you include psychology as a science or not. If you do use the JACS3 data, then, then women are dominant in science by something like for, you know, 40, 48 percent. I don't think you can exclude psychology as a science. I can't think why well, anybody would well, think that was reasonable. Go. In that case, women dominate in science by 48 yeah. percent. I mean, how many people appreciate that? Not many. Yeah. Uh, now let's turn to all subjects, and I'll, I'll, I'll not show, I'll not dwell on those percentage numbers. Let's just look at the big picture. So this is total acceptances now. Can you see that graph? Yeah. 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 So this is just total acceptances, the ratio of men to women. So it's all subjects plotted against time, same time base from 2007 to last year. Um, and you'll see that the ratio now is 1.36, if you can read that small number. So women are 36% more is what that means. But what I'm really pointing out here is this trending upwards line is not showing any sign of abating. So it's not just the current position that matters. No, it hasn't levelled off, has it? It's not levelling off. And we'll see that in the individual subjects as well in a minute. So that's the ratio. You can look at that in terms of absolute numbers. What does it mean in terms of numbers? So this is the number of women accepted into university. This is acceptances in a given year. So this is per year. So it's women accepted versus minus men accepted. How many is the excess? And it's now reached just short of 90,000. So there's just, just under 90,000 more women than men going to, into higher education, predominantly universities, each year now. And again, it's obviously trending up. So I thought it'd be worth looking very quickly, just skimming down the individual subject categories so you can get a feel for what the numerical size of the dominance of women is and, and what the trend is. So these are the JACUS 3 subject categories. Uh, I think I've plotted them all. I don't think I've left any out. I might have aggregated some together, but they're all here. So firstly, medicine and dentistry. Well, it's trending. This is the ratio of women to men. All these graphs, ratio of women to men. It's trending up is the first thing to note. And it's now at a ratio of about 1.75. So there's about 75% more women than men in medicine. And it's trending up from about 2012, isn't it? If you, if you mm. trust the numbers. Yep, but it was, it's been above one yeah. since before records began. 
Yeah. Uh, subjects allied to medicine. Um, this will include nursing, but it also includes things like radiography, pharmacology, that sort of thing. Um, so the, the ratio here is huge, because, largely because of the, the nursing component. So it's four and a half times more women than men. Absolutely huge. Slight trend upwards, um, not as steep as some of the others, but it is trending upwards. Biological sciences are dominated by women uh, by about 68% now, and again it's trending up. Veterinary and agricultural sciences, which I've lumped together, uh, again trending up, dominated by women by a massive factor of 3.5. If you look just at veterinary, it's more like a factor of 6. Um, but they dominate in agricultural sciences as well. Law. There's now over twice as many women as men studying law, and it's trending up again. You'll see the theme is trending up. In it. The only, there's only one exception to either trending up or relatively level, and that's maths. Maths is the only exception. Languages, ratio of women to men, is over, over three now, and trending up. All this is UCAS data that anyone can plot. Art and design, well, very slight trend up, not much, but slight trend up, and nearly twice as many women as men. History and philosophy, which you might have thought men would have a chance in. Well, you don't do so badly, but there are still 20% more women than men, but fairly flat, it's not, not trending up much, that one. Uh, social science, as you'd expect, dominated by women, about 60% more women than men, not trending up much at the moment, fairly flat, not trending down, no. Education, massively dominated by women, um, about f six times more women than men, fairly flat, fairly flat, but massively dominated by women. Architecture is the only non-STEM subject which is dominated by men, um, but not overwhelmingly. So the ratio women to men now is less than one, it's just over 0.6. So that means there's about six women to every ten men in architecture. But it's trending up, which means that it's tending more towards equality. All the others I've shown you are trending up and hence away from equality. This is trending up towards it. This is, this is the theme. Where, where women dominate, they're becoming more dominant. Where men dominate, they're becoming less dominant, is, is the overall picture. Physical sciences, again, men dominate, but not by very much. Um, the ratio of women to men is, is more than 0.8. So it's somewhat more than 8 women to every 10 men. So the dominance of men in physical sciences is, is not great, and it's diminishing because this is trending up. So... In a few years, there'll probably be parity there. And finally, we get to the ones where men really do dominate. Um, maths, um, there's about six women to every ten men. And this is the only one that's trending down, as I mentioned. It's the only one. Um, and then the two subjects, which I've already mentioned, where men do dominate strongly, where the ratio is 0.2, so that means there's, um, th there's one woman to every five men in engineering and IT or computer science. So they're the, mm. they're the exceptional cases. But you see, the overall picture is very, very strong dominance by women in most things. And where they dominate, they're getting more dominant. Where they don't dominate, men are getting mm. less dominant in general. Um, these subjects, if anything, yeah, there is a trend upwards in engineering and computing. Only quite slight, though. So that's the big picture on higher education, which, you know, I think a lot of people find these numbers quite startling because they're never presented to the public in this way. What do you think, Rick, this means in terms of um, income? I mean, I'm, I'm 
I'm guessing, but I don't know if we know, does this mean that women now are more likely to earn more money than men, which would probably be another surprising thing if that's the case? Well, it, it's, it probably is the case. The, the, the whole narrative about the gender pay gap is totally skewed by children and childcare. Uh, if you look at the gender pay gap disaggregated by age, the, the gender pay gap is negligible before the age of about 40. It's when childcare comes into play and women either give up work or go part-time or downshift or something, that suddenly men's earnings looks a lot greater than that of women. But below 40, there isn't a gender pay gap, really. Uh, and in some areas, women do better than men. And if, if you know, I'm, I, I can't remember all, all the detailed stats, but the, the whole narrative on the gender pay gap is... Is, is mm. misleading. It does come down to, to childcare. But the, the, the people who promulgate this narrative know that. They're not stupid. They know it's about childcare. And what they're actually trying to achieve by levering the, the, the pay gap issue is um, to get more women working full time and having their children looked after in, in preferably state funded childcare arrangements. That's, that's what their political aim is. And the pay gap is a way of levering um, public sympathy by make, making it look like these privileged men are diddling women. But it's actually a, a political narrative for a different purpose. But it's a very old-fashioned narrative, isn't it? Because I don't think that generation of people in their late 20s and 30s who face these kinds of circumstances where they're They've, had, they've got their degree, they've started a career, they've got choices about family care and how you then progress in your life. I think they're viewing it in a much more pragmatic way and aren't carrying this political agenda. They're making decisions between themselves about who is the best person to spend time looking after the children and who is the best person to be you know, maximising their income and um, you know, benefiting the family together as a, as a you know, as a cooperative, cooperative exercise. I don't think, my impression is that people aren't preoccupied with the politics on the ground, in, they're pragmatic. No, that, well, I think that's right. That's why there is a pay gap, and that's why it does click in after the age of 40, because that's the way people actually behave. And people because, make those choices, and those choices yeah. change with time uh, as culture develops and changes. Um, but uh, there's, yes, but there's a, there's a dis distinction between the way ordinary, fairly non-political individuals behave based exactly on what you've said, their personal circumstances and their personal preferences um, and political pressure. I mean, yes. It, you know, remember, and you have people who are, putting, who are creating those pressures who are carrying some agenda from... Uh, you know, 50 years ago or something. I, it's, it's difficult to know yes. where they come from and why they're still carrying them. No, it's very easy to know where they come from. I mean, it, <laughs> read, read Simone de Beauvoir. She, she said um, very clearly that if you give women choices, they'll make the wrong decision. <laughs> <laughs> right. they'll, do frivolous, they'll do frivolous things like raising children instead of doing serious things that they should be doing, like going out to work and and, and uh, prioritising being a wage slave. <laughs> but, but, I mean, Simone de Beauvoir, I, can't, I don't know when she died, but I certainly, you know, I, I, I mean, that's stuff we read when I was an undergraduate, or even at school, and it's, I mean, that's ancient history, isn't it, and irrelevant to no, people now. No, no, which is, it might be to you and me, but it's not to the people pursuing this agenda. They really but, are pursuing this agenda. But who are they? Who are the people pursuing the agenda and where are they pursuing it from? Are they the, are they the provosts of universities, uh, you know, in their 70s? Are they, um, you know, media people in their 60s uh, I know, and I 70s? Don't think you, I don't who are think they? You can, I don't think you can just... Uh, I don't think you can just say it's entirely due to an older generation. I mean, there, I think there was a hope that that would be the case and they'd eventually retire or die off and... and uh, sanity would return but I mean look what's happening in universities uh, anything but sanity returning uh, 
<laughs> quite the opposite. They go in the, the opposite direction. Insanity rules, as far as I can see, in universities. And yes, the administration is the problem, probably. Not, not so much the students. I mean, one of the, one of the kind of gurus that we've been very interested to follow who stopped podcasting recently is Eric Weinstein, who was banging away for a year or two when he was talking publicly about it, uh, about the way in which the older generation no longer seems to be retiring or making way for younger leadership. And this dead hand of people who are carrying, mm. uh, you know, both their own personal interest in securing the incomes and, and, and power mm. that their position holds, but also, you know, dominating the ideologies of, of institutions uh, has become a real problem. I mean, we have, we have presidential uh, competition in the US in which everybody's over 70, as far as you can make out, or at least any, any significant candidate is over 70. And, you know, this is it's also reflected in the senior echelons in universities where you have ancient provosts hanging on to their position. Uh, and and I, I do think there's an issue here about a disconnect between people who are actually trying to live their lives in practice and the people who, who somehow carry an idea that they're going to tell people how they should live their lives. Um, absolutely, absolutely agree with you, yeah. And it's, a, it's a big issue way beyond education. But if I, if I can just return to um, the, the effects of, of this, because I think, yes. what do you think the more generic issue that Jill was raising there was, well, OK, we can say that women are very strongly dominant in most subjects at university, but what, what sociological effect is that going to have? Uh, I don't point to the, the pay gap as being the issue at all, really. Um, that's a non-issue to me. What is an issue, though, is something that no one ever mentions, because the subjects that women dominate are the subjects that are to do with people and animals. The subjects that men dominate are the subjects to do with things. And that split is absolutely clear and, in, and not disputed. So think about it. In terms of the, the subject area that a, a professional uh, is going to be dealing with, if it's, if it's a thing, right? if, it's, if it's about building a bridge or a new computer, right? uh, that, that uh, that thing, the bridge, doesn't care about the sex of the person that's designed it. The only significant thing is the competence of the person, right? That's all that matters. The bridge is going to be strong enough to do its job. It doesn't care about the sex. But the gender of a professional is potentially a lot more relevant when you're talking about things to do with people. So if you're talking about education or law or... Um, or healthcare, or social social work. In those cases, the the sex of the professional might be very relevant, and they're the subjects strongly dominated by women. So, if you're going to have a popular narrative or a political narrative that is pressing for greater gender equality in education in certain subjects, what subjects would you target as being the ones where greater gender parity was more important? And the answer is the ones to do with people, whereas the ones that are to do with things, it really doesn't matter so much. And yet, what we're actually doing is exactly the opposite. We only bang on about, oh, we must get more women in science, we must get more, more women in STEM. And we never talk about getting more women, getting more men in the people-based subjects where they are in the minority. And this, this is the pernicious effect. It's not, it's not pay. It's the fact that all human-based services are being strongly dominated by women via the educational system. But this, this, is, is, this is part of a, a different pattern, isn't it? I mean, we're... I mean, this is a week, isn't it, where people are remembering Princess Diana's death, uh, and that takes us back to the public um, emotional outpourings that surrounded her death and her funeral and the way in which the public turned against the royal family because they weren't showing enough public distress 
uh, and joining in with the general weeping and uh, mourning that was going on for somebody that nobody had met, apart from a few intimates. Um, and, uh, and, and, and marked a, a, a change in the, in, in the country's kind of approach to emotional outpourings. And if people want to prioritise the emotional aspect of the professional relationships they have, then clearly, um, you, you know, wanting to have more women doing it and women being encouraged to be kind of emotional and emoting is, is going to paint it. But, it, I mean, if, if I want to surgeon to do my surgery or I want a lawyer to do my law I don't mind what sex they are I want competence whatever it is and I think the same goes for teaching you want competence you want people who do the job well and know what they're doing and really this idea that you might be concerned apart from giving people the opportunity they need Rick you know whenever I talk to you I seem to start ranting it's just a, <laughs> Extraordinary. How does this yeah. work? Anyway, I, I think I put my message thing. across. I'll oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> in principle, in principle, I agree with you. I'm not suggesting um, actually we should be targeting any subjects for deliberate, focused uh, gender rebalancing. Um, but I'm, I'm only saying that if you're going to do that, then the people-based subjects are, w are the, where it where it would have some rationale, potentially. Um, whereas the thing-based subjects, it really doesn't matter at all. But in principle, you're right. It's, it, it's only, it, well, it's two things that matter. It's competence and lack of bias. But, but in the people-based subject, there's also issues of understanding and empathy, which, you know, th that's significant as well. But it, it basically, might be. basically, I don't really, di I don't really disagree with you. Um, th my beef is that, um, well, first of all, my beef is that I suspect the numbers I've showed you are far more, uh, you know, they, they paint a far more uh, a picture of, of women's dominance, which is far greater than people would would normally realise, because you don't get this talked about in the popular media and there's no reason why not because this is all publicly available data um, and, and worse than that all the narrative runs contrary to what the facts are yes and so we should be promoting equal opportunities promoting competence I think we can't distinguish between the genders on the basis of empathy I think um, that's a basic uh, human uh, capacity which varies in a similar way across you know between the sexes I'd you know I'd be astonished if anybody could prove otherwise and um, so we, we must be trying to aim for equal opportunities and the, the question I suppose is at what point do you stop engineering society to try and make equal opportunities because at some point you have to you, you find yourself talking about equal outcomes which is not the same thing at all so once you've once you've got your degree, is that the point at which equal opportunities it becomes less of a political priority? People fight their way after that to the top of their greasy pole. The state engineers it up to the point of a uh, university degree. Uh, where does equal opportunity lose its drive and become equal outcomes that you're aiming at? Sorry, Rick. I'm. Well, veering way I, yeah, off topic. Yeah, way way off topic. But I mean, I'm certainly, I'm firmly against um, imposing anything that sounds like um, yeah, equal outcomes, because it's that mm. way madness lies. And of, of course, mm. there is pressure to do that. That's what yeah. the reporting of gender pay gaps is about. Well, the and brilliant thing about what that's, you're that's what the diversity agenda is about. The diversity agenda. It, Although yeah. they, they refuse to accept the word quotas, they're applying quotas uh, for yeah. non non white ethnicities and uh, uh, non heterosexual sexualities. I mean, there there's enforced. Well, it's not equality of outcome that's being enforced; it's preferencing actually. Well, I, it, I mean, I'm sorry to have interrupted you there, but I, I mean, this the brilliant thing about what you're talking about is it promotes discussion and an attempt to understand the what's happening and what the consequences are likely to be which mm. is which is very stimulating 
and mm. um, very helpful to us and I'm sure to other people. Yes. One of one and of the issues that I'm I asked the question about the money because I think it does have a big impact on decisions that people make. You know, maybe the woman should do the work because she's more likely to get an income which is able to buy a house. Um, my my worry is always about the issue of parenting and the impact of these decisions on parenting. And I'm very struck by the last interview that we did, and I think you, you saw it, Rick, of Naomi Murphy, mm -hmm. yeah. who talks about the seriously dangerous personality disordered prisoners and likely to get out of prison and the work that she had done with them over a 20-year period. And this issue of children that were left at home with their parents being the majority of those kind of prisoners they weren't removed they into weren't care. removed into care hmm. and I, I don't know why i'm i'm saying about this but it's this thing about handing over the care of your child to the state in the hope that that is going to be adequate whilst you go out and earn your money and you know you can you can make a decent living perhaps both of you if you if you both work can have more implications than you imagine and, and I think people don't realise that either. Maybe that I, that's an overreaction on my part because, I mean, working with doing care proceedings for as long as I've done, you, you see the impact of parenting on children writ large every day and the emotional abuse of children. And this is not a working class issue. This is an issue which goes through all the classes. You know, I have seen it in all the classes. The abuse of children happens in every class. And, you know, people need to be careful about just thinking about these issues in terms of, well, we got enough women doing this work or enough men doing this work. Surely the most important thing should be if we're going to have children, we need to have the best way of bringing them up. And that has to involve the people who are the parents, not the state. Which means that people have got to rethink their priorities, haven't they? Because you're seeing an enormous shift in in the essentially in the power within families and um and that presents people with choices and dilemmas which haven't been which haven't been confronted before and so people have to decide how they're going to parent how they're going to protect children and prioritize them mm, well there's about a hundred different things i could say in reply to that. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, the whole issue of family. Well, I agree with you. The whole issue of families is central to um, everything we're seeing. Um, and let's not forget that whether you have two parents or not is one of the strong yeah. determinants on your educational success. Absolutely. Uh, and your educational success, in turn, will determine your financial success, which will in turn. <laughs> Um, be strongly correlated to whether you are a um, someone who d fails to live with his children. So yeah. you're, so this brings us right back to your first slide, doesn't it? Where you are showing the discrepancy in school outcomes mm. um, across different groups, and the issue there is why are these children functioning differently, given that it's. It, you know, poverty clearly is an important part of that. But why are they? Why are the different cultural groups functioning differently? And um, yeah, exactly. And because uh, you know, as something I to do with parenting. On this graph, it's not, it's not black because black Oops. African and black Caribbean are very different, and so presumably, yeah. you know, it's not like genetic. Um, it's yeah. something else. And um, many people have claimed that family breakdown, fatherlessness is the issue. Uh, and it is mentioned, um, the, the issue of family breakdown and fatherlessness is, is mentioned in the select committee, the education select committee report that was, that was published last week on um, disadvantage to, to white working class pupils. So, you know, that, that narrative is beginning to surface in, in government circles. So. Uh, yeah, so without question, it, these these things are all interrelated. This is the problem. You can't say one causes the other. It's it's 
it's a dynamical system in which mm. A causes B and B causes A. Mm. Okay, so this is this is my third third thing here. Well, um, I think I'll just talk to the graphs on this one. Uh, I'm going to talk to two areas. First is key stage two SATs. So this is the standard attainment test that um, are taken by uh, pupils in the last year of primary school. So this is age 10 or 11. Um, there's been changes to the way that the assessments are done and there's been changes to the way they're reported. Um, rather than go into all those details, I'm just going to keep it simple. But the essence of it is that there is both teacher assessments and tests. So there's an opportunity to compare the two. Uh, and that is a way of getting, getting at teacher bias, sex bias, gender bias. Um, obviously, you don't expect if a teacher makes an assessment, they're going to come up with exactly the same um, score, however you score it, as a test will. The teachers may be more generous, they might be more harsh. Um, but the issue is, if they are more generous, are they as much more generous to girls as they are to boys or, or not? So you can define a bias, whatever subject you're talking about, and I'll use the same definition in a minute for A-levels as well, so it's quite a portable definition. Um, can you see on the screen there that, um, yeah. that equation? I yeah. know algebra turns people off, but ho hopefully this is simple enough. Um, the, the subscript G there stands for girls, and the subscript bo B is for boys. TA means teacher assessment, and test means just that, so test score. Mm. So these are um, the percentages of girls um, attaining a certain attainment according to the teacher's assessment and the percentage of girls doing, you know, having the same attainment according to the test. So the difference between the two is the amount, the average amount by which the, the teacher overscores the girls compared with the test. So it's a measure of, it, if you like, the teacher's generosity. If it's negative, then, then they're nasty teachers and they're underscoring. And the other bracket is the same for boys. So if you take the difference between the two, um, that's the amount by which um, the teacher's generosity to girls exceeds that to boys, if you want to look at it that way. In other words, it's a measure of gender bias. Mm. So the important thing here is that I'm not measuring whether the teachers score higher or lower compared with the test. I'm measuring the gender bias because the the effect of the, it's normalised out in the definition. So it's, uh, it, the bias is only about the teachers compared uh, with the test and the two sexes compared. So it is, to my mind, a genuine measure of bias. Now I've been tracking this for a number of years. I started looking at this about five or six years ago, and I don't know why I started looking at it because I didn't. I think I just stumbled across it. I didn't particularly think there would be any bias. Um, but if you plot that measure of bias, and it's a, as a percentage, because all those terms in the equation are percentages. So the bias is a percentage in, um, for the, the cohort in question. You can do it um, for reading, you can do it for writing, you can do, do it for maths. They're the three main subjects which are looked at in the stats. Um, and you can do it, um, again, I've simplified here, but you can do it either at what I've called in the caption level four or above, which means that that's the standard you're expected to attain at that age. Or you can do it for level five and above. So that's rather above the expected standard. Okay. So th in one way or another, they're reported. They, they, they use different terminology in recent years. Um, but it's broadly the same thing. It's basically either attained the expected standard or attained a higher level than that. 
Um, so you can you can use either of those attainment measures measures, and you can look at either reading, writing, or the lower graph mathematics. And what I should have pointed out, made it clear, is in the definition, a positive bias means the teachers are more in favour of girls than boys. A negative bias would be more in favour of boys than girls. And you see from the histogram that the bias, there are some instances of negative, but overwhelmingly it's positive, positive bias. So overwhelmingly the bias is in favour of girls. It can be up to 6%, but it's generally around about 2 or 3%. That's mm -hmm. in reading and writing, and similarly in mathematics, typically around about 2%, always positive. So I was, I was quite surprised when I first came across, across that, but it does seem to be, it's only a small percentage, 2 or 3%, but, but it's persistent. It's consistent across years. I mean, I've plotted what? 11 years. Are these large numbers of children? So in other words, can we oh, they, oh, this rely is the on the statistics? Population. Oh, yeah. this is the whole population. Yeah. So, so oh, it's a real huge difference. Statistics. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, haven't, I should have done it properly and looked at um, error bars and statistical confidence tests and so on, but it's fairly, from the fact that it's stable over time, yeah. it's fairly obvious that it's real. And yes, the statistics are huge. I mean, there's there's hundreds of thousands in the in the population. You know. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Um, mm. So th the thing I would emphasise here is that um, well, a couple of things. Firstly, assuming it is biased, and that's the right word for it, uh, it doesn't mean that all teachers are biased. It doesn't mean um, that it's one sex of teacher rather than another which is biased, uh, and. Um, it doesn't mean if it is biased that it's it's conscious or deliberate. So there's question marks over all those things. Mm. The the other thing I point out is that I believe the educationalists know about this phenomenon. You would expect them to. They pour over this data a good deal more than I do. But they don't ever call it biased. What what. <laughs> What they say it is, is that girls underperform on tests. Now, I don't know how you react to that, but... I, I don't understand it. <laughs> no. I don't no. understand that. Yes. <laughs> Anybody well, who girls. does badly in a test says they've underperformed. I mean, like, yeah, they could have done better. Exactly. Yeah, that's what it, yeah. <laughs> exactly. But the, the, yeah. the idea that girls specifically do worse on tests than boys doesn't bear much examination because... What I've not gone into here is the fact that girls, of course, do a lot better than boys. I mean, girls genuinely do a lot better than boys. Even if you just base it all on tests, mm. girls still do a lot better than boys, more than 2 or 3%, and if yeah. up to about 12%. <laughs> so so it's, it's stretching things a bit to say, well, girls are outperforming boys on tests. Oh, but they, they underperform on tests. In other words, you're saying they should do even better which is tantamount to saying, well, boys are just naturally more stupid. <laughs> but I think, so, I think there's plenty of evidence, <laughs> uh, I mean, research evidence, to show that if you tell teachers that a particular pupil is able, then, they, then the pupil performs better because the, uh, some, some aspect of the dynamic between teacher and pupil changes absolutely. because of the teacher's there's, expectations. That's absolutely right. There's been some fascinating work done on just that. And it, there is... Um, you know, low expectations is self-fulfilling, or high expectations mm. is self-fulfilling. That's that's very true. I mean, a, a number of studies have shown that. And the distressing thing here is, you can do surveys of pupils entering primary school and ask them. Um, you give give them pictures of of hypothetical pupils, which. They're not told the the issue here is whether they're boys or girls, but you can just ask them. You know, put a circle around the one that you think is cleverest. You know, and when they're very young, like five or six, um, girls will say girls are clever, and boys will just be evenly split, split neither girls nor boys. But once they get to age seven, boys and girls are both choosing girls as being the ones they expect to be more clever. So it's not it it this sort of self-fulfilling expectation is quite pernicious. There's somehow pick, boys are picking up 
that adults, whether it's teachers, parents, or whatever, they're picking up the expectation that girls are going to be do better at school, and it, it snowballs from there. You can pick it up at age seven. It's quite distressing. Mm. Yeah. Well, look after your sons is the message, isn't it, as well as your daughters? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that's, that's, that's right. And uh, Here's, I don't know if you want to go into this, is, um, there, was a, there was a government white paper, I think it was 2016, called Education Excellence Everywhere, which was concentrating on geographical differences between attainment. Um, but it's sort of fraudulent, really, because, yes, there are geographical differences, and this is, this is plotting the English regions. Um, that's what the different histograms are. Um, blue is Let me region. just show that. I, I need to show that because I'm not showing it at the moment. Oh, OK. OK, let's see it. We've got it now. Figure three. So, yeah, this is, this is the geographical um, regions in, in England. And the, the blue bars are reading, the full bars are tests, and the empty ones are to the right of them are teacher assessments. And then the full pink or red bars are writing, tests. And then to the right of that, the pink but empty bars are writing, teacher's assessments. So you can see at a, at a glance that the teacher's assessments are always higher than the tests, except a few cases where they're the same. Um, so this isn't boys um, and girls, this is just no, girls. No, It's just the gender is, gap um, between... It's girls it, no, minus it, it, boys, that's right. Yes, it's the, sorry, it's the gender gap between yeah. girls and boys. So the gender gap, as I was saying, it's always, before, positive. Gender, it's always positive, and mm -hmm. it's at least 6% and up to about 14%. Uh, and there's a, that gender gap is there on tests, as it is on teacher assessment. But the gender gap always gets higher on teacher assessment. <laughs> so that's the bias showing through again. But, but there's a real gap because it's all positive, even when just based on tests. But the, 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 the geographical dependence, it's there, and London does best, and the, the gender gap is least in London, but the gender gap is there across everywhere. It's, it, that's, that, it's absolutely um, across the board. OK, so that's uh, primary school and uh, Key Stage 2 SATs. We can now look at A-levels, if I'm not taking up too much of your time. Last year was a very interesting year for A-levels. Um, <laughs> complete nonsense, actually. Um, I don't know if you remember the debacle in which... Mm. Well, the government's mistake, of course, was that they decided to award A-levels without having exams. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, a child of six could have told you that, you know, that's only going to lead to controversy because yeah. everyone will say, oh, it's not fair. And what happened is everyone turned around and said, not fair. And so the, uh, the political lobby leapt in and made hay with that and the media helped them and we had all these, these weepy 18-year-olds appearing on BBC saying I was cheated <laughs> <laughs> which as George was saying earlier you know oh you didn't do as well as you expected to do oh, what a surprise <laughs> but of course <laughs> this time he had every reason to complain because somebody had just assessed the result it wasn't based on their performance in an exam so of course you were going to get irresolvable controversy <laughs> so in the end um, the, the A-levels were reissued because what they'd first done, and this is what the controversy wrongly focused around, is the Department for Education or its, its um, agents in this issue had applied an algorithm. They'd applied an algorithm to the teachers' raw assessments, frankly, to make them a bit more sensible. That's my interpretation, with good reason, based on data, I can assure you. Um, but that hadn't flown because of all this controversy and the, the, the political hay that was made out of it. So the government were, well, I don't know if they were obliged, but they did go back to saying, well, OK, we'll just use 
the teacher's assessments, the raw assessments. So this is quite useful from the point of view of looking at bias because we can, we can now uh, compare the teacher's assessment based results in year 2020 with the immediately preceding years based on exams as, as a comparator. And as the uh, aforementioned child of six could tell you, um, in, in, the top, in the top grades, there was massive grade inflation. Surprise, surprise. So let's have a look at the data then. So f figure four here. This is showing the number of the top grades, that's the three top grades, A star, A, B, as a percentage of all the A levels graded. And you can see this is against year from 2010 to 2020. And you can see before 2020, that percentage had been pretty level at between 52 and 53 percent. And then suddenly, surprise, surprise, based on teachers' assessment, it leapt up to 67 percent. It's excellent, isn't it? <laughs> Um, so much you know, better. It's, it's not. It's not even subtle. It, but by the way, I'm not going to show the the moderated results. But with the algorithm applied, what the algorithm did is they took this obviously manipulated result and placed it somewhere much more reasonable down here. Still a little bit generous, by the way, but mm. within reason down here somewhere. So they should jolly well have used the algorithm, of course. But there we go. So that's all, that's both sexes together. That's all, all results for both sexes, just showing you the, the obvious inflation. This is what it looks like when you disaggregate by sex, though. And I've looked here, you could look at A star A or B, but I've looked just at A grades as an illustration. Because it's the A grade that will get you into a good university, generally. If you get three A's a year, you're away. Mm. A star's even better, but A's are good enough. So you can see um, the, the, the boys are blue, the girls are the orange line. So the girls were slightly high percentage in previous years, but not that much. So in 2019, there was only a 1% difference between them. Two years before that, even less than that, more like half a percent difference. And then in 2020, with great inflation, not only did, well, both sexes were given A grades more often, yeah, the gender gap has now increased to 3%. So this is the bias again. Mm -hmm. It's, yes, bo both, both sexes of pupil are being rewarded by inflation, but girls more than boys. So you can look at that in a different way in terms of the, abs that was a percentage. You can look at it in absolute numbers. So this is the total number of A star, A and B grades awarded to girls, minus that to boys. So this, and you see in the years prior to 2020, it had been between 50,000 and 60,000 in round numbers, uh, and not trending upwards particularly, waving around a bit, but round about 55% is what it had been in the last few years, and it leapt up to 78 percent. 78, sorry, that's not percent, that's 78,000. And this leapt up to 78,000. <laughs> so roughly speaking, that means about 23,000 more girls than boys were awarded the top grades based on what looks to be just bias from the teacher's assessment. 23,000, it's not a small issue. So when I spotted that, <laughs> I used my same definition of bias that I've used before, there it is again, but just rolled out to the A-level results. And now what this means is um, instead of teacher assessment, I'm using the results um, for 20, year 2020, and, and by test I mean the results for 2019. So it's comparing... 2020, which is teacher assessments, with 2019, which is exams. Okay, so it's the same logic. So you can define that bias subject by subject. And I've done that for every subject. Uh, well, every subject where the number of candidates is above 
two and a half thousand, which is, I think, all subjects bar two or three that were really, really small, like something like Irish language or something like that. So I've, I've ignored the really small ones where the statistics are too questionable. But all those above two and a half thousand, this is the bias in this table for every subject. And remember, positive is in favour of girls, or, or young women in this case, negative is in favour of young men. There's one that ne just sneaks into the negative, which is OML, which means other modern languages. All the others are positive. Anything so these, this is just 2020, is it? This is 2020 compared with 2019. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's the teacher's assessment in 2020 compared with the exam results in 2019. It just shows how terribly unfair the exam results are, doesn't it? <laughs> so, the bias against girls. No, yeah, yeah. yeah, you see, girl, girls don't... Now it's revealed at last. Exams. Yeah. So, so what we should do is only have teachers' assessment from now on, because otherwise <laughs> we're disadvantaging girls. Yeah. And you're, you're, you're upset. You're, you're a good feminist, George. <laughs> Three daughters. <laughs> <laughs> I've skin in the game. Do with you. <laughs> I've got two sons, which is, you know, why we're at loggerheads on this. <laughs> Anything up to 8.4%. 8, 8 Interestingly, the, the, the two where the bias is largest is computing and sports, where, which you might expect to be dominated by young men. But, and indeed, indeed, they are dominated by young men, but... Um, but the bias is greatest in those cases. But positive for, for all, and an average of 3.2%. So again, like the SATs, it's not a huge, not a huge difference. But when you turn it into numbers, it's it's tens of thousands of, uh, of more of one sex going to university to do their chosen subject than another. Mm. So I'm not claiming, of course, that you know that the the. Um, boys doing or young men doing less well in education is all to do with bias let me stress that I think we've we've seen the the test data is uh, even if you just use test data girls do better girls do better in 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 a levels when uh, when they are based on exams so but what you've got here is on top of that if you like natural or real or unbiased um, dominance by women you've got superimposed on it whenever the opportunity arises of a bias as well a gender bias as well which just makes it even more egregious in my view so you you've got a story here which is cultural differences making an enormous difference um a, a gender biases making a modest difference um, and then you have a, a difference between men and, and women, or boys and girls, in how they're actually performing. So you've got... Yeah, uh, yes. I mean, you, let's not lose sight of the fact that there are differences. Um, there are cognitive differences between the sexes without, without question. And uh, it probably particularly affects um, pupils at primary school, um, where I, I think the, the, the rate of cognitive maturation is different between the sexes so that's part of the issue and I think I think um, boys tend to be in general naturally disadvantaged in anything verbal not just mm. reading and writing but speaking as well actually for a long time I don't think it persists in adulthood actually there is evidence if you look at tests done on young adults up to age 25 that in literacy things young men catch up with young women, even though th up to about age 18 they're still behind. But, I mean, whether that's something to do with the world of work and men get more interested in reading when it's, when it's related to earnings or something, I, I don't really know. But, but they do seem to catch up um, on that literacy thing, but they do lag behind for a long time. And if, if, if you're not reading very well, and again, I, I have two dyslexic boys, so this is close to my heart. If you're not reading well, you will struggle throughout your whole school career. Oh, it does make life when, much more difficult. Mm. Oh, and, and, and when you come to A-levels, you're going to choose maths and physics and engineering because they're the subjects that least require words. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and people don't appreciate that, to a large extent, boys choosing those subjects, they're actually running away from the dreaded word. Mm. Well, 
And the white working class boys are really at the bottom of the heap, aren't they, Rick? Very emphatically. And, uh, you know, it's not new, this. People have been saying this for a long time. Mary Kernock Cook, when um, she was head of UCAS, used to really emphasise this, not just in her official UCAS reports, but she had articles in the mainstream media um, saying, I mean, this is going back to 2014, 2015, saying that, you know, we need to look at, at boys and white boys in particular because look at the data, they're, they're the ones that are being disadvantaged. So she's been saying it for a long time. She's quoted, incidentally, in the government's report of last week. Oh, that's interesting. Which I was pleased to see. Um, so, yeah, there's, and of course, not just her, there's, there's, there's others as well that have been been saying these things for a long time, but the, it doesn't get through. This narrative is suppressed. And you have to That's abandon this BAME uh, kind of catch-all um, yeah. uh, cliché that, that, you know, that, that uh, yeah. um, and, and some of the clichés about girls, of course. Why do you think it's yeah. suppressed, though, Rick? What is that? Do we just not care? Is this the middle, the middle class not caring about the working class at all? Oh my goodness! Another one where there's a hundred answers, but but the um, <laughs> it, it, you can't disentangle politics from it. I'm afraid. I wish you could, but you can't. You, you, unfortunately, there is power in division. That's what it comes down to, and politicians and people. Well, politics by its nature is the pursuit of power. And there is power in setting one group against another, because by doing that, you create a constituency which you say you speak for. So by, by, by pushing, for example, a race-based agenda, by adopting identity politics, you can create yourself a political um, constituency out of those people who you are ostensibly supporting. It doesn't even matter whether your policies will really help them. That's, that's the truly wicked thing about it. But it, it's difficult here to talk about this because this is why I'm, I normally try and stick to data because yeah. then my own views on things which are, which are more a matter of opinion um, don't don't pollute the picture but I mean of course I do have as I'm now exposing I do have views on these <laughs> inevitably when you contemplate these things you have to say well what are we going to do about it then what yeah. is the policy going to be and at that point you have to get into opinion because you can't be sure you can't because policy is about saying well if we do this it will have this effect in other words it's about prediction it's not about data you've got it's about prediction, which is always about opinion. And, and so, so your own politics necessarily comes into that and it's much more, much more uncertain. But I mean, well, we've been touching on a lot of these points. I mean, the, the relationship of family breakdown and fatherlessness is something that a lot of people have been talking about for a long time, but it doesn't it doesn't get much notice. It is submerged in the, the polite political agenda, although it's beginning now to emerge, as I think it has to. Because these things get labelled, you know. If, if, you, if you talk about those... I mean, it, it, sing, single parenthood is a sort of holy cow. You can't, you can't point the finger at it and say, well, you know, this is damaging to society because then you seem to be blaming single parents. And let's be honest about this, in the, uh, many single parents, it's not their fault they're single parents and it might not be what they want. It's more been done to them than, than, yeah. than uh, they've done it to themselves. Yeah. But th that doesn't alter the fact that statistically over the whole of society, it may be a very corrosive thing. I believe it is. Yeah. But it's become a holy cow and you can't mention it. And, and so you will get, you know, maybe it's changing, but until fairly recently, if you started talking about single parenthood, family breakdown and fatherlessness, then you were just labelled a hard, hardline, antediluvian conservative and, you know, your views could could be ignored because you just, you know, you're living in the 1950s or something. Well, there's a lot in the world that people don't have any data about. 
uh, and that allows wild speculation and distortions and uh, misleading approaches and manipulation, etc. So the more you can bring data into the debate so as to restrict the scope for that kind of uh, dishonesty in politics, for example, or in, in any kind of public um, uh, endeavour, uh, the better. Or that you're always up against the people who want to promote their prejudiced uh, attitude. So keep pushing the data, Rick, because yeah. that's really yeah. the only thing you can cling to and to avoid just chaotic um, bias, that, prejudices. Right. Abs absolutely right. That's been my policy from the start, really, because it's clear that in, in the areas that we've been talking about today, the, the, the political narrative has, has not exposed the issues that I've been exposing on these, these areas today. That they find it advantageous for one reason or another um, to obfuscate these points, and that's always wrong. I mean, if you're not going to be driven by empirical fact, then, then the only thing you're going to be driven by is prejudice. Mm. Yeah. A very dangerous thing. Thank you, Rick. We can pleasure. wind up there, I think. And, yes, um, pleasure. Thank you very much for another a tour great through the talk. Data. Thank you, Rick. Well, I, I succeeded helpful. in my primary objective. I got another rant out of you. <laughs>